we have a great panel of local business leaders who are going to talk to us about how they've built and maintained and protected their own online reputations. Kevin Clayton is the VP of Diversity and Inclusion for the Cavaliers organization. He's going to lead the panel. He's in his first year with the Cavs, and in his role, he's responsible for the development and leadership of the diversity and inclusion strategic plan at all the Cavs properties, including this one. So please join me in welcoming Kevin Clayton. Can you all hear me? Yeah. The mic's on? That's good? OK. So before we begin, I can only do this the way that we do, that, do these introductions. Cavalier style. So earlier, we, when, when Carrie kind of talked about being here, Rocky Mortgage Field House, and then Catherine was sewing out the, the balls, there was not a lot of energy coming back. Right. From people, okay. <laughs> so before we do that, okay, Catherine talked about a Monday after the fact that we lost an hour, right? How about the Monday after back to back wins by the Cavaliers? <laughs> Okay, good stuff. So my name is Kevin Clayton, and from a background standpoint, not only am I the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for the Cavaliers and all of our organizations, but also how it connects to what you all are doing. I've also have owned three different businesses as an entrepreneur and started my career with Procter & Gamble, so I'm, I'll be able to offer perspective with our panelists that comes from a totally different lens as well. Let me give you a little bit of background on some trends that I just want to share with you, just to kind of level set as we continue the discussion about protecting your online brand and building it. According to Nielsen, 59% of consumers prefer to buy new products from brands familiar to them. Online, represent, uh, rep, online reputation can take a bad turn. There's a common saying, reputation is everything. It takes 30 years to build, yet completely can be destroyed in 30 seconds. 45% of people discovered something from an online search that made them not want to work with somebody. And lastly, according to Bright Local, which is a very reputable uh, internet kind of search firm and results uh, firm, 49% of consumers need at least a four-star rating before they choose to use a business. So a couple things that we know. Social media plays a totally different role. One of my daughters works for Twitter, and the stories that I can tell you about what they don't post you already know what's out there, but what they, don't, what they don't post is amazing. So with that, from a perspective of kind of the evolution of kind of digital and online and the internet, when I was with P&G, we would just have kind of here's some brand information. Now you have this communication connecting point where people are actually commenting and having discussions. Now businesses are interacting with their consumers, with their potential customers through the internet, through social media. Also from a reputation standpoint, and you just saw there was no greater example than what Catherine had just shared, but a person's reputation also connects to their business reputation, and a small business owner, there is no distinction between the two. Who you are from a business standpoint is also who you are from a personal standpoint. So without any further delay, let me introduce our panelists. And I'm gonna ask you to do this Cavalier style, Here's what we're going to do. Do I have music? Uh, we have walk-up walk music. music. Well, I didn't know. We don't have walk-up <laughs> music. <laughs> so, <laughs> my request. So, <laughs> just like, I didn't read that part of your contract, Michelle. <laughs> so, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to introduce each one at a time, just a little blurb about their company. And can we give them an applause as they come up? So first, Michelle demuth Bill, who is the content and creative director of the Chef's Garden. Secondly, we have Rachel Heller, who's a founder and primary maker of My Little Deers. And Michelle Tamalo, who is the chief people officer and co-founder of Fit Technology. Some love for Michelle, how about that? All right, thank you. Excuse me. I feel like we should just switch up the agenda altogether and just have people give us some ideas of what they want to post and then we can weigh in whether they we should do it. Yeah. We can do thumbs up, thumbs down, or maybe we can look at some of our feed. Yeah, <laughs> so that's a great idea, but how about we say we did it and we don't? I know. How about that? Okay. So actually, if I could start with, with Michelle. Sure. Um, can you give a little bit of that background about your company and who you are for our audience, please? Sure. 
Um, I work for the Chef's Garden. Uh, we grow vegetables for kitchens across the world. Um, I've been with the Chef's Garden for 14 years and for the past six years, I've been focused more on the digital content um, and their social presence. Um, and I've helped kind of build the brand um, from where it was in 2007 to where it is now. So that's a little bit about me. Okay, so here's what I, early. <laughs> there we go. So here, here's, here's what I love about what's in Rachel's uh, bio. Rachel's like, look, I had this hobby and I turned this thing into a side hustle and now I'm just kicking it real style. So <laughs> Rachel, can you just share a little bit about what you do and kind of my little dears, please? Sure, uh, my name's Rachel Heller. Uh, so corporately, I actually work at Westfield um, in our IT department. Um, but I had this little hobby business of leather making um, uh, activity and I turned it about a year and a half into what I like to call a micro business. So there's small business and then there's what I am, a, a zero to three uh, small business company uh, that's uh, in marketplace uh, platform and also in different re retailers across the state. Okay, thank you. And last, please, Michelle. I'm so delighted to I'm so delighted to be here this afternoon. Um, I am one of the co-founders of Fit Technologies, we're a managed IT services firm located here in Cleveland. And we celebrated 20 years um, just last fall, and um, it's been interesting growing our organization over the last 20 years and being a service business. So it's our team of about 80 uh, staff who act as the technology department for small to mid-sized businesses, lots of K-12 schools, and nonprofits all over Ohio and in um, several other states nationwide. So obviously this idea of brand and um, having a service business where our employees um, are all part of um, our reputation is an important topic for today. Okay. So thank you. So from a process standpoint, I'm going to ask our esteemed panelists several general questions in which I'll ask them to answer, and then I have some very specific questions for each one. Unfortunately, I have a feeling the content is going to be so rich, we're not going to have a chance for questions at the end. Please jot down any questions that you have, and during the networking session, our panelists are going to be more than happy to answer those. So it doesn't matter who starts off first. Let me ask this question. What are some reasons that a powerful personal brand will make you successful? I'll go ahead and start. So I feel like, uh, you know, people will go to you if they trust you and believe in you. So put yourself out as that trustworthy um, person um, and, and build trust within your community and your, your feed. Um, I think that's really important. I think we've yes, seen over and over that we hear that people do business with people that they like and trust. And especially from the perspective of um, how they trust you, maybe again, from the perspective of um, putting out about your brand, about your level of expertise or your knowledgeability or your friendliness or all of those sort of things. So it's not, it's, it's important to keep in mind when you look at clients or in this market, we all have to look at as employees as an important part of the, uh, our brand strategy because all of us in the market that we are in Cleveland um, definitely are competing for top talent. Rachel. Um, I would offer that most consumers are looking for a connection. So creating that personal brand and showing part of your authentic self, I think enables um, customers to really connect and then show their, their uh, approval or their um, engagement with your product that way. Okay. So, so Michelle, if I could, um, Chef's Garden, obviously it's important to build a reputation and a relationship with your customers. Can you talk about how you can build trust and created that personal relationship with your customers? Sure, so the Chef's Garden has been built on relationships. Um, we've been, we've, we've grown from the beginning from word of mouth. And I feel like our social presence has been that extension to the customers that we already are engaged with and have relationships with, but also customers in our niche that we might not know about or they don't know about us. Um, so it's, you know, building that connection with uh, the social, uh, from a social aspect in our niche market, um, and just continuing that, that trust and that relationship with them. Okay. And Rachel, for you, if I think about my little dears, how were you able to communicate with your customers? What have you found the successful methods of communication? And, and how have you learned to do those, or how have you learned to do what you do successfully? What are some of the lessons learned? 
Sure. So uh, marketing yourself as a business, a small business with zero to three employees is very different. Um, uh, and also working most, most days, nine through five. Um, so I focus on creating connections um, through social media. So there's the stories that we leverage, there's posts that we do, um, and really kind of creating a connection so folks can reach out. We do um, messaging, uh, so we collaborate on products and really just creating different points uh, for engagement with customers. Okay. So Michelle, as Catherine just talked about some of the mistakes that are made personally in using the, the internet or using some of the different social media platforms. So if you think about Facebook, you think about Twitter, Instagram, which allows us to connect to the, the world, if you will, but used improperly, as we just heard, it can be detrimental personally. Can you talk a little bit about kind of how, how these platforms also would use incorrectly kind of can impact your business? What, sure, and I think that um, we definitely had some great examples, I think, that, um, that Catherine brought up. Uh, the whole idea, I think, especially as we're looking to create these connections and make these stories, pictures are a key part of how those connections, I think, are made. And I can't say how many times um, when we, you think about, you definitely need to think about what's in the background of your pictures, because imagine all the things that might hang in people's offices, um, that it's just a good reminder that you're taking that, that that's top of mind when you're posting those types of things. I think that it's also important to think about the, uh, who are your clients, and how what it is that you're posting is going to be taken into consideration. I think that the other um, one of the things that we've encountered and many people I think in a, sometimes in a professional services business is while you may be while we, for example, may be explaining um, what we helped a client do in terms of their IT. You would never want to, if you're Fit Technologies, be saying, hey, guess what happened at XYZ today? Because we saved them from this sort of situation that happened. Or, hey, look at this server closet. And there might be, again, something in the background that would indicate whose server closet that is. And now look at um, those sort of things. So again, that attention to detail is just so, um, really so critical. And the, the whole idea of when you think of the thoughtfulness around um, not wanting to post quickly and having, there's oftentimes I think the tendency that we want to post quickly. I think it's again having um, a couple people look at what you're posting and kind of sticking to that plan of um, what it is that we're working to communicate with our brand. So, so this, this is interesting when I think about online presence, when I think about the fact that that is the easiest way for small businesses to now communicate. I just know when I started my own business, I had just enough money to start the business. Now I'm competing against all this online domination from other other businesses. Can, can you, all three of you, I'd love to hear your, your, your perspective as to you know, how can a small business with limited resources compete from a online standpoint? So I can start. Um, so there are amazing tools available. So the, the first thing I did was research um, apps available. So I leveraged a uh, mobile device. There's apps that help with search engine optimization that help with hashtagging because I had no idea how important hashtags were prior to having social media for my business. Um, but looking at those tools in different outlets and there's very cost effective and even free applications that work really well to create a consistent brand image for you create imagery, do stock photos, things that companies have to invest quite a bit of money in. There's actually free resources uh, uh, across applications um, on your, at your fingertips that you can readily use for your small businesses. One thing I'd add to that is um, know where your audience is. Mm -hmm. Spend time where they are. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of different avenues that you can go within social media, but if your audience isn't there, you're not gonna be successful. So. And I was just gonna say from the perspective of um, being a small business owner, we're also, um, you may have a local market, you may have a global market. The idea of leveraging the business network here in Cleveland and in other places, because there's so many uh, professionals who this is their job. And I think sometimes we think, oh, no matter what size your business is, it's 
it's too much, I can't afford it. But when we think about growing our business, that investment is, in, is, a, is as important as paying the electric bill or just the, the this is um, table stakes now, is to have an online credible presence. And I guess for me, one of the things that I was able to find is like community colleges and schools that were in the area in which I was, that they have classes of students that would do it just as a project. So that was helpful to me as well. So I want to go back to Chef's Kitchen for a while and just talk a little bit about, again, branding. And you have an interesting kind of uh, dichotomy because you have Chef's Garden, but you also have Farmer Lee Jones, two brands, so it's kind of those competing brands. Maybe talk a little bit about the two brands, but the direct question is, what are some of the key insights of effectively maximizing your online presence, and particularly when you have these the, the, the person and then you have the, the company? Yeah, so we have quite a few different um, platforms that we use throughout the company. We have the Chef's Garden, and we're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, Farmer Lee Jones, all the same and as well as our sister company, the Culinary Vegetable Institute, um, and we have all the same um, platforms for those that we utilize. For us, it's knowing where, just like I had mentioned earlier, it's knowing where your audience is, um, and that will build the most for your buck. Um, spend your time there, be present there, be consistent when you post. If you have a cadence where you're, you're gonna post five times on Instagram during the week, Choose the best days that your audience is there, post them. Um, and luckily, when you're a brand on Instagram, you can have analytics in the background. So all that information is available to you. Um, and another key point is don't post in ghost. Um, don't post a, an image of carrots and a bunch of people are commenting and, and talking about your carrots, but you forget that they're there. Engagement is key. It's not just engagement from your followers, but your engagement back to your followers. And so I would imagine even that engagement, as you're saying, is part of the reputation that your company is built. Is that Absolutely. Um, you know, I have a habit of making sure as an organization that we follow, you know, comment on all of the comments that we get. Um, and even do call outs to chefs that are using our products um, just to maintain those relationships and build them even even further. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you know how it is, it's really aggravating when you call somebody and then they never return the phone call? <laughs> from an online standpoint, that's kind of the, the same experience when you don't respond from an engagement standpoint. It's not like it's the same as almost nothing. Which could call. also turn into right. negativity. Um, when you're not available to people, um, they'll look at it as a negative, you know, movement towards for them, and then it, bad things could happen. So. Okay. So, so Rachel, I want to talk a little bit about the early starts and launching uh, my little deers. Where did you start in order to build your online reputation, and kind of what was that strategy? Uh, so I looked at local businesses and, and different entrepreneurs that I uh, admired their social media presence and looked for what types of uh, content were they sharing, what frequency, kind of to the, the point that Michelle made around cadence. It's really being intentional about having a strategy of the type of content I'm sharing, the frequency I am sharing it, and then also having that engagement back with customers. So I researched a ton. I tried different things. So there's functionality for polling and you know getting feedback from folks. Some of them bomb entirely, uh, but you always learn something out of those engagements so that you can try something else in the future um, that brings in new customers or brings in a new perspective that you can leverage. So Michelle, just think about your company and what it does. I'm sure that there are tools in which uh, your company has that would help to kind of monitor and protect online reputations. Can you maybe just share with us what, what are some of those tools and how do we go about doing that? And um, along those same lines, these tools that I'm going to talk a little bit about, these aren't specific necessarily to just a tech company. These are tools that um, really any organization, especially um, I think uh, folks who um, are aware of the brand or looking at product development and those types of things. So first off is setting up Google Alerts and that's something that anyone can do and that's something that then can be set up uh, anytime that 
Michelle Tamalo is in the media, then I get a Google alert saying where that was. So that's nice when you think about how important our brand is around specific people. And then obviously your company's name, if you have company products, if there are things that relate to your business, uh, specifically um, from, from our perspective around um, security and cybersecurity and those sort of things, we get feeds all the time because if there's a significant um, attack that's going on, we want to get that information out to our clients as soon as possible. So Google Alerts is really helpful um, on a lot of levels. I think that the, um, and you all might have other tools that you use as well. I know that um, several folks use social mentions and that again is a tool set that allows you to see um, some analytics around how often your products mentioned, how often hashtags that you um, have already keyed into have been used. And then also this kind of this scale of, um, and again, it's an algorithm, but is that mostly favorable or mostly unfavorable in relation to whatever you have put into um, this site? There's also um, other tools like that. Um, there's actually socialmentions.com, there's mentions.com, there's mentionsanalytics.com. So um, searching that will allow you to see those options that are there. I don't know if you all use any of those specific. We have in the past. Um, for us, you know, within Hootsuite, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Hootsuite, but you can do your social scheduling and monitoring there. Um, we utilize that and um, it, it tags, we put in our hashtags and what exactly we want to follow and we see where we're mentioned. So we use that a lot. We do as a company use Google Alerts. Um, and we, we're all pretty much set up for that too. Yeah. So let me ask this question to all three of you. And if you think about kind of the, the whole advent of um, kind of social media online and some of the late adopters were like, well, no, I want to do it old school. I mean, people don't, people won't be able to know me online. I'm human. I want to be able to communicate who I am. Can you just share with our uh, audience, each one of you, how do you humanize the online marketing, if you will, of your companies and your brand of materials or services so that people can relate to you as humans, not necessarily just what's on the computer screen. I'll start with that. Um, so for us, it's about creating that emotional connection, um, getting, letting people into our world at the Chef's Garden, um, talking about our philosophy and our story, talking about who we are, um, you know, keeping keeping Farmerly Jones, um, you know, familiar uh, with our audiences. But the biggest thing is is creating that emotional connection. So we mentioned Farmer Lee Jones a couple times. Can you share with who's Farmer Lee Jones? Okay, so Farmer Lee Jones, can we show his picture again? Is um, a brand in himself. Uh, he, no lie, he wears a bibs, a white t-shirt, and a red bow tie every single day. Um, he's got 15 pairs in his closet, all lined up, fancy, it's great. Um, but he is the, 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 the draw, not the draw, he's the, the face of the farm. Um, he's the farmer. So if you look at our logo, it's chef and farmer. He's that farmer. He goes um, door to door to restaurants and visits them and sees how and sees how we can improve. Um, he's just, that, that, that picture explains him right there. Do you involve him in any way through video online with your online friends? Yeah, so we do some live uh, live videos. Um, we, we did a lot last year. We've kind of cut back on it this year. Um, he's in a lot of our videos that we post on YouTube and share via social media. Um, he's, he's very present in our social, yeah. Okay, thank you. Rachel? I would build off of that also and say we show some of the behind the scenes. And I say we, but again, that's me. Um, so I will show production videos. So that is the fast laps that you can do on your phone. So I have shown where I actually hand sew um, some of the leather clutches that we make and showing that video. And the, the feedback that we get on those types of posts is just seeing how the products are made, seeing the behind the scenes of me doing it at my kitchen island, you know, with my girls interrupting every so often to ask for juice or something at that point. Um, creates a connection that they get to see kind of the behind the scenes view of what our company, um, my company is about. And I'll just throw out there again, it's those stories which makes the difference and I'll use the example at, at our company. So let's say that it's um, our staff that's coming out to your uh, business on a regular basis. When we introduce you to our staff, it isn't necessarily that we're saying, okay, these are this 
you know, this is Michelle certifications. It's more than that. It's much more, here's the picture of this person, or sometimes they do a video. They talk about why they love tech. They talk about why, you know, what their hobbies are, that sort of thing. It's because it's creating that uh, personal connection um, and having it really be about the faces that are part of the brand and not just one face. Um, in that perspective, but all of the faces that make up your organization, which goes a long way to building that trust and that familiarity um, that people have for your brand. I had one more thing. So I actually, in prep for this, pulled my customer base and, and said, was it product or lifestyle posts that were the most um, engaging content? And it was interesting that um, it was nearly divided directly in half. And most of them actually commented and said it's in fact both. I love getting the lifestyle perspective of the recipes and the products and all of those, but also being part of the product evolution of the company too. That really helps them feel part of the brand. Okay. And when you when you said that, one of the things when you asked about are there cost effective ways that business owners can do that, I think that even if you have a very small customer base, ask your customers. They want to give their feedback. They want to tell you about that. And so that's one of those things um, I wanted to mention that utilize one, your network and your customer base to ask the questions as you're developing your product and your brand. Okay, so I have one last question for each of you and then I have a bonus round. I love a bonus round. No. No, that's what a bonus round is. But how about if I give you a hint as to what I'm going to ask you in the bonus round? Okay, and that's going to be an example of perhaps when your company's reputation might have taken a hit from something that was either posted, very similar as Catherine talked about it personally, from a company standpoint. So that's coming up. But here's the question I'd like to ask uh, to you, Michelle. Content is important. And when you think about content, do you have some examples in which you can share that, of content that would help build the, your, your company's brand? Sure, I'm gonna start on our method. So we use an 80-20 rule. Um, so 80% of the time we're posting about inspirational, informational content, um, and the other 20% of the time is spent doing the direct sale. So it's the direct call to action. Um, and it's important that that's within a month. So it's not, you know, looking at a whole week. You don't want to post every single post that you post, a direct call to action where you're pushing your, your followers to go purchase something from you. Um, keep it more or less about the story and your philosophies and who you are and how you can, um, um, you know, engage with them um, and make them feel like part of your social media. Um, part of your company rather than sell to them continuously. So that's the methods that we, we take. Um, and we post, you know, we do blog posts, we do videos, um, we'll do pictures where it's just imagery with quotes. Um, anything that's really relevant quote-wise that is relevant to your company and to your philosophies and your beliefs. Um, and then statistics are huge too. Make it look like you, make it show, show them that you're a leader in the industry by using statistics you have. Um, in quotes and testimonials from your customers. Okay, so so Rachel, uh, what areas of focus do uh, my dears do you use just to continually work on the reputation of your brand and your company? Um, I think just reconciling back to the mission and the value that I set out on. So it's hard to uh, not get caught up in trends um, or what other people think your product should be, but reconciling back to what did you set out to do as a product. Um, and as a company and making sure that you stay true to what that is versus trying to become a do-all, be-all in the industry. And so my last question to you, what are some reasons that businesses should have proper online reputation, reputation management? Well, again, this last couple hours has underscored again and again why we have to have um, management. I think that one of the things that uh, could be a takeaway for business owners here is many of us who haven't had an online crisis maybe think, well, if that happens, maybe I'll know what to do. I'll say the same thing in relation to like a technology crisis. We, we don't think that that X, fill in the blanks, X is going to happen to us, but it very well may. It's not a question of if, it's when. And so I do think that it's an important takeaway is to think about what do you have um, in terms of resources if you had a social media crisis? Do you have a relationship within, uh, with a marketing partner? Do you have skills within your business 
uh, who could attend to that. And it would be one of those things of start planning now so that if there is a crisis that relates to your employees, your brand, your product, that type of thing that you'll have a strategy because obviously when it's a crisis, it's a crisis. And Michelle, watch how this is gonna work. Okay. So thank you for sharing with us the potential of online crisis. Please share with us across all three of you have you had an online crisis where you've had to deal something as it dealt with your brand reputation? Kind of share with us what that moment was and how did your organization, how did your company deal with it? So I'm gonna say it's not the epic proportions that we talked about here, uh, but we've definitely had some, and it um, was a post that involved, one of the things that we do at FIT is post a lot about how we're engaged in the community. For instance, I'm sure that I will post that I was here today. Um, and one of the things that we often do is um, we support our local team and um, all of our teams, but we were talking about opening day at uh, the Indians and we had some online conversation around Chief Wahoo and that was an interesting opportunity for us to be able to share our values really clearly about how we feel about the, the Indians um, moving away from that brand image. So it was unexpected what, because this was years ago. Uh, and so in that situation, it wasn't a crisis, but it required um, thoughtfulness and um, not knee-jerk reactions and taking that conversation for at least one of those people definitely offline. So what I'm gonna say is not necessarily something that we, uh, a crisis that we have been through, um, but I was talking to my son about this presentation yesterday, he's 17, and he says to me, Mom, Farmer Lee Jones really needs to do, you know, what's on trend, you know? And I'm like, hmm, Farmer Lee Jones doing a dance on, um, no, I, I don't think that's gonna happen. My point is, is that you need to stay on brand, stay on brand with your company, with you, with who you are as an individual, just because something's trending um, and you think that you're gonna go viral, going viral is not your goal. Your goal is to stay true to who you are as a brand. Uh, so in an infancy state, I have thankfully not had any brand mishaps, but I would offer that it's caused um, our family to kind of reflect on the content in which we, we project out in social media, what we participate in, uh, when we have products and several retail partners, uh, we become a little bit more, have some notoriety that we need to be mindful of as we're engaging with folks. So it's caused us to just reflect a little bit to what Catherine was talking about um, and being intentional and cautious about how we engage in social media. Okay. So, so in closing, um, when I think about even my Procter & Gamble days, back in the day, and P&G's largest marketer and, and advertiser, it was well, all publicity is good publicity, as long as you get people talking about you. Those days are gone. That's not the case. So on behalf of Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, on behalf of the Cleveland Cavaliers, I should say the surging Cleveland Cavaliers, uh, why don't we give these three amazing women and three amazing business leaders a round of applause.